Hey there, I'm a glue stick, so I have one job. I glue kids stuff. So sorry for being jealous of Geico, who does a ton more, like give you 24-7 access to thousands of licensed agents. And Geico has been around for over 75 years and has a 97% customer satisfaction rating. While I've just got mediocre adhesive skills, Geico also has an award-winning mobile app. Uh Uh-oh, arts and crafts time. No eating the glue stick, Miss Lydia. Geico, expect great savings and a whole lot more. Golgan Wingo with you on a Thursday morning on ESPN Radio and ESPN2, wherever you are and however you're uh, listening or watching. We appreciate it. Glad you're with us on a Thursday morning. Uh, we are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Penzel performance line. And uh, we'll get to uh, what we've sort of considered the halfway point yes, of the NBA yes, we will. regular season in a minute. But first, mm-hmm. there's something you need to share. Yeah, I, I do. I do a lot of fun stories here. This one is, is make you chuck a little bit unless you, you know, are on the other side of this one and are going to be bummed about it. What just <laughs> happened in the, the turn of the new year in California? Well, they uh, they legalized uh, an herb. Yes, they did. Recreational use. They legalized marijuana in California. And what's a big festival coming up? It'll be April 13th to April 22nd. Coachella. That would be in California. In, in California. The Palm Desert, Palm Springs yep. area. Indio, Indio, Indio. California. Yep. It's, it's on private property, the Empire Polo Club, uh, placing it on, uh, you know, private ground, which puts it under local jurisdiction. Now, I'm sure that herb found its way to Coachella many times, but no. now everybody would be thinking, Oh, now it's going to be legal there. What a party we're going to have. Not so fast. Still not going to be legal at Coachella. It's on, again, on private property there. So it's under that local jurisdiction and they are not making it legal. I don't know if that's going to stop too many people, but it certainly could be even out in the open even more if it were. But, uh, they have, uh, marijuana and marijuana products are still not allowed inside the festival. Uh, even, uh, in 2018 and beyond, if that changes, they said they will update you with a new answer. But I'm sure a lot of people thought, oh boy, is this going to open up some avenues here? Not so fast. Let me just say yeah. on, on enforcing that policy. Yeah. Good luck. With good that. luck. Yeah. We wish them all the best yeah, in their future ball. endeavors. Mm-hmm. Our future endeavors enjoy breaking down the NBA with Stephen A. Smith from First Take in the Stephen A. Smith show, <laughs> which can be heard nationally mm-hmm. every weekday from one to three right here on ESPN radio. As he always does, he's going to bring the straight talk. Yes, he is. Brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. Uh, Stephen A., great to have you in. Good Thanks to see for being you guys. here. How y'all doing? We're doing, doing good. Well. We're a lot doing of bummed good. out people, we think, in California in that whole Coachella really? thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't get me started. Yeah. We won't. Don't get me started. What, what we, is, we will seamlessly move on. Then. Stanzik, what's that stupid word you use for Nominally. halfway? Nom- nominal. nominal. This is a nominal point. Do you ever know? You don't, I don't know what that is. This is the halfway point I, of the I, NBA I, season. I, well, listen. Um, you look at it and you just say to yourself, you know, sometimes the All Star Game is fifty games in or whatever the case may be. I just, I just, you know, I love watching this time of year because it's it's at this point where I get to look and really, really judge where you are and what you should be. Like for example, right now, what's on my mind when I think about the NBA? Everybody thinking you can think about Kevin Durant, you can think about a uh, LeBron James or what's going on in Cleveland, Boston, or whatever the case may be. I'm looking at the Washington Wizards, a team that I believe you know, has a, enough talent to make a lot of noise that has, comp- has, has repeatedly disappointed me. Mm-hmm. And I watched them blow a game last night and Bradley Bill in that last play where he, he, he thought his shot was going to get blocked. So he ends up trying to pass the ball in midair and passing it to himself. And I, <laughs> I, I just, it's unbelievable some of the stuff that I have seen, but I, I watched that stuff and, you know, Washington has disappointed me. Miami has lived up to my expectations because I I labeled them before the season as my sleeper and right now they are they are they are creeping up on everybody. They they really are. By the way, Washington is unbelievable unless you realize it's Washington then it becomes yes. believable That's because right. those things just seem That's to right. happen time and That's time right. again. Okay, so as it sits right now, the Celtics are in the top spot in the East. The Raptors are second. The Cleveland Cavaliers are in the third spot. Mm-hmm. When you see this thing going forward, where do you see the biggest challenge to Cleveland? Is it Boston? It is Boston, yeah. without question. Uh, it's Boston because Kyrie Irving is a superstar. There's no doubt about it. And Jason Tatum mm. and Jalen Brown, they are incredibly impressive. You got to remember, it's not just what they can do offensively. They can hit some three point shots. They could take the ball to the hole and they could score, but they defend as well. And they're both young and they're long. It's not like they're old and short. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. they can defend. They're not scared of anybody. It's one of the reasons why they give the Golden State Warriors a much tougher time than a lot of people will realize because they have length 
at the wing positions, which enables them to go out and defend on the perimeter. And as a result, you've got to have an interior game in order to really, really mess with them. And you got to remember in today's day and age, you've got a lot of, a lot of, a lot of teams looking for guys that can step away from the basket and make plays on the perimeter at the four and five spot. And if you're gonna if you're gonna rely on your inside game, but you don't have Shaquille O'Neal or yeah. Olajuwon or somebody like that, it's going to be tough for you. And that's why the Boston Celtics are a team to be reckoned. It is crazy. Hayward when he comes back, he's 27. Kyrie 25. Brown 21. And Tatum 19. That kid. Yeah. To you, is he the rookie of the year? Yes, he's the best rookie yes, out there. Sir. For me, I I love him and I love Donovan Mitchell, but I got to give Jason Tatum the edge right now because of the success that the yeah. Boston Celtics are having with Gordon Hayward going down. You got to remember, if Gordon Hayward were healthy, it would be Gordon Hayward with Jalen Brown in the starting lineup. Jason Tatum would be coming off the bench. His minutes would be reduced. The shot opportunities would be reduced. You know, as a result, his level of productivity wouldn't be what it is. The fact that Gordon Hayward went down elevated him uh, to a to a high profile position before he may have even been ready and he's lived up if not exceeded expectations. But what I love when I watch the Celtics play is the way they play defense. I mean, they have uh, time and time again had some of the best teams in the NBA and throttled them at what they do best. And if you're looking long term, especially in the postseason, that's the thing that pops to me. Well, the thing that pops to me is the exceptional coaching of Brad Stevens. Yep. I mean, Brad Stevens is the best young coach in basketball. He's one of the best coaches in basketball right now. He's an absolutely <laughs> sensational coach. There's no doubt about it. And the thing, when you look at Danny Ainge, who is clearly an elite executive. He has proven it the way that he has built this franchise. You look at guys like Marcus Smart and Terry Rozier. These are young, miniature rough riders. They're very physical. They're relatively undersized in terms of height, but their girth, uh, their mass, they're willing to go at it and, and be feisty and battle with you. And then you have the length of Tatum and Jalen Brown. And then you have the exceptional play along with the experience and, and the unreal and surreal skills of, of Kyrie Irving. And that's what you have. You, you know, it's one of those situations where you look at Boston and you say to yourself if Gordon Haywood had never gotten hurt we might be looking at this team and saying they could beat Cleveland we might be looking right. at them and saying that if what, Gordon Haywood had not gone. What do you down. think of the whole Gordan Haywood thing? And now Danny Ainge, oh, he's out of the boot. You know, Gordon Haywood's got he the eye playing. look. At, and, 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 and Brad Stevens is like, whoa, right. whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy on this well, thing. I, I went on first take yesterday. I was there opening night in Cleveland. Uh, the injury took place mm. under the basket. I was right at the baseline. And I saw it. And it, it, it was the most gruesome injury that I have seen in my career, in my 20-plus mm. years of, of, of covering the NBA. And that to me, it was so gruesome. I don't care what a doctor says. I don't care what a Danny Ainge says. I don't care. I know what I saw. Don't let that man come back this season. Make sure you do everything you can to be for him to be 100%. It was that gruesome of an injury. He doesn't even need to be thinking about coming back. Just amazing, though, out of the boot, though, walking around right. doing it. it and that's is, fine. It's and incredible. That, and that's, fine. that's fine, but that's entirely different than, than running play. and oh, jumping agree. and cutting and not to mention the contact that you're yeah. going to endure. Stay the hell away from the basketball court. Uh, I don't, would don't completely, don't completely agree with that. As far as an individualistic thing going on, Kevin Durant scores 40 last night. Well, it was outdone by Lou Williams, who mm-hmm. scores 50, but he becomes the second youngest to get to 20,000. LeBron's first. He bumps Kobe to third. Then you have Will Chamberlain, yep. Michael Jordan. Will Chamberlain did it in yep. seven seasons. Seasons, which yeah. is just ridiculous. And with the, with the Kevin Durant past the going to Golden State, leaving Oklahoma City and all that, winning a title, where is his ceiling as far when we start? Because again, he's a guy that goes into the all time conversations as years go on, not, not just where the game is today. I, I think that me personally, I think that when it all is said and done, Kevin Durant can end up top five all time. Uh, I think that he could go down. I think he's the only legitimate threat to Kareem Abdul Jabbar's all time scoring record. He's so efficient. Everybody looks at, you know, the career 27 point per game and, you know, he's averaged 25 points per game or better for the last nine or 10 years. We get all of that. He religiously shoots above 48, 49% right. from the field. The accuracy, the marksmanship, the fact that he does it. If, if, if somebody just unleashed him and said, Kevin Durant, go ahead and shoot 25, 26 times a game, what would he average then? He is just an elite scorer. And th- this notion that he's six nine, he's not six nine. Mm-hmm. He's about six eleven. Yep. He's about six eleven. That wingspan is about seven six. Okay. Well, he is the definition this, of long. This dude <laughs> th- 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 absolutely true. And, and he's just a scoring machine and he's so efficient. From the perimeter, from the free throw line, inside or out, it doesn't matter. When you have that level of efficiency, you just can't ignore the level of greatness that he puts on display on a night-in, night-out basis. Stephen A. Smith with us here from First Take and his own Stephen A. Smith show on ESPN Radio talking about the halfway point of the NBA's regular season. Now, you brought this up, and I, the, it, 
I, I'm, and now I need to know the answer to this. You said Durant could be in your top five. Who is Stephen A. Smith's top five in the NBA of all time? I, wow. I'm really curious. I well, would, I would love well, to know the well, answer well, to that. For me, it's Michael Jordan. Yeah. It's Magic Johnson. Um, it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, Is LeBron Tim, in there yet? Tim Duncan yeah. and LeBron James. That's pretty good. Tim That's Duncan, a pretty good Tim, five. Tim Duncan and LeBron James. Now, now, see, here's where it becomes a bit sacrilegious because I'm never taking Michael Jordan out under right. any circumstances. Right. I think most people would be on board with yeah. that. But I might take out Magic. Wow. Magic is the greatest point guard that ever played the game. But let's be real about something. Magic Johnson was 6'9". Mm-hmm. And most opponents he went against, he towered over. Right. So as a result, that obviously facilitated a better, you know, not to say that he couldn't pass because he's such a phenomenal passer and just a savant, a basketball mind. But in terms of his athletic ability, his gifts as a basketball player, it's really up here in his mind because he's so highly intelligent and his passing ability, shooting, ball handling, defending. Magic Johnson's not on the level of the other guys that you would mention, okay? He's not even on Kobe's level in that regard. And so when you look at the greatness of Kevin Durant, if Kevin Durant stays in Golden State, if Kevin Durant, let's say, wins two or three more titles, let's say Kevin Durant ends up capturing five titles in his career, when you look at him, how many guys were 6'11", 7'6", wingspan, had to handle ball handling right. skills of a guard, could shoot from anywhere, inside or out, and oh, by the way, has elevated himself to a big-time defender in the game of basketball. There are very, very few people. We used to look at Kevin Durant and say, Iceman, George Gervin, that's what he reminded you of. Well, George Gervin has even said, he's better. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm not in that conversation. Kevin Durant is on that kind of level to the point where at some point in time, if you if you say he can't move Magic, it's because he's never been the leader that Magic Johnson was. Right. Galvanizing the troops. He's the orchestrator of Showtime, the architect of Showtime. Kevin Durant hasn't been that, but skill-wise, yeah. he's there. I'm, I'm, re- I'm really interested in, in this, not to go away from where we were going, but from your list, so two things. Are you saying that Magic Johnson is the greatest Laker of all time? Mm-hmm. And then... Did Tim Duncan, in your mind, have a better career on the list than Kobe Bryant? I think I think Tim, Tim Duncan is the greatest power forward of Agreed. all time. Yep. Right. Um, it used to be, in my mind, believe it or not, it wasn't Carl Malone. It was Kevin McHale. Kevin McHale was. I don't know why people forget about Kevin yeah. McHale and how unstoppable he was in the post. Ten feet and in, never it brought was the a ball rap. down. Ten after feet and that in, ball it just was a wrap. up you there the entire you time. You couldn't stop Kevin McHale. But I consider Tim Duncan to be the greatest power forward of all time. As I think about his career, if he had a better career than Kobe, it's primarily because Tim Duncan was in the same system, same coach, level of continuity, no mm-hmm. drama, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Kobe, you were with Shaq, then you were without Shaq. Phil Jackson was your coach, then he wasn't your coach, and then he came back to be your coach, and all of this stuff in between. So you could make the argument, you know, it's debatable. As it pertains to the greatest Laker of all time, here's the only reason I give the edge to Magic. I give the edge to Magic because Magic was a leader. Yeah. Kobe became one. Magic walked in mm-hmm. as one. From the start of his career, it was his show. And you had guys like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, James Worthy, and everybody else literally deferring to the Magic Man with Pat Riley after Paul Westhead becoming the coach and saying, Showtime has arrived. Take it away. Magic did all of that, which is why I give him the edge. From the get-go, and of course, remember him playing center in Game yeah, 6 of the Finals ridiculous. that year. Put yeah. up, up 40 points in that well, game? Well, I give 42. Ridiculous. It was 42, 42, yeah. like 42 and 15. But the only reason why I don't bring that up as much as other people do, Magic was great and he was a rookie. Yeah. But it was Caldwell Jones that he was going up against. It, it wasn't like it was Moses <laughs> Malone or somebody. It was Caldwell Jones who was playing center. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, also Chocolate Thunder, God rest his soul, Daryl Dawkins, mm. who was, I mean, he was a foul waiting to happen. Daryl Dawkins came off the bench and picked up two yeah. fouls within two <laughs> minutes. That was the difference. Those Sixer teams of the 80s were one of my favorite teams all time when you had Charles Barkley, not obviously for that series, but then you had Caldwell Jones, Bobby Jones, Mark Ivoroni, the yep. doctor. I love that team. Andrew Tony, one of the greatest shooters of all time, but is, is, oh, I kept having those breaks on his feet. Mo Cheeks. Absolutely. Yep. I, I, I love that team. Um, that, that's really an interesting list. Uh, by the way, real quickly, I, I once played golf with George Gervin. 
has the biggest hand you'll yes. ever see. And every time you'd step up with the ball, he'd be, well, young fella, show me what you got. Greatest yeah. Show me roll. what you're working <laughs> with. Great. And I'm just right. trying to hold on to the club. Yes. You know? right. Show me what you got, he kept telling Greatest me. Greatest finger roll in history. I That's could exactly finger right. roll, as yeah. he used to finger say. Roll. Okay, we, we talked a lot about the Celtics. They're in London taking on the Sixers. Look, we were all in on Philadelphia and embra- trusting the process. Mm-hmm. Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. Okay, you were not. A lot of people were. Mm-hmm. Did we get to them too early? Did we push them up too high for what they've become? No, um, Ben Simmons is a jump shot away from being the second coming of LeBron James. This hey, now. Ben Simmons is special. Is, 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 listen, Joel, Joel Embiid is special, but ain't nobody Ben Simmons. This dude is 6'10 with those ball handling and passing skills and that basketball IQ. If this dude gets any kind of a jump shot, you know what? Here's the, the crazy part. If he got free throws, if he made free throws, this guy would average 25 a game. It's just that simple. Without the jump shot, just free throws. That's how good he is. When you look at it from that perspective, the fact that you got two cornerstones of your franchise, you got to remember, we're talking about the Sixers team and their number one overall pick, Markel yep. Fultz, hasn't even played yet. Right. And so when we look at it from that perspective, the sky's the limit for this team if Ben Simmons can get himself a jump shot. But I am not somebody who will ever – ever um, support the process. They threw seasons, not games, seasons. It was an abomination what they did. It was a disgrace uh, to the point where the commissioner himself had to get involved uh, and ultimately talk to, to Sixers' ownership, ulti- which ultimately spearheaded the arrival of Jerry Colangelo and then ultimately Brian Colangelo, where you actually started winning games. It's not Sam Hinkie's fault, the former GM right. for the Sixers. He did what he was allowed to That's do. Exactly you know, we right. don't break it down. It's not his fault. I'm not blaming him. <laughs> He created cap space. He got picks. I understand all of that. But the process, think about that. Who could not have succeeded with the process? So Trey Wingo, Mike Golick, you're not radio host. You're novice GMs. Here's your job. I need you to lose as much as you possibly can. I can do yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and just make sure <laughs> you're you playing accumu- in my, you're playing in my sure, wheelhouse. And, and, Stephen and, and, a, and just so, make I mean. sure you can accumulate some picks along the way, but don't bring veterans. Don't try to compete. Just go out there. And oh, by the way, don't worry about the public because I'm giving you the license to announce to the world. You're not trying to win. Yeah. You're not trying to win for seasons. Who does that? Who gets away with that? There's something about the, I tell uh, Mike Missanelli in Philadelphia and, you know, reporters that come up to me. I remember Kerry Champion and, 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 and David and everybody were talking to me. I said, look, I'm trying to be nice. But at some point, sometimes somebody will get cussed out. They keep bringing up the process to me because I worked in Philadelphia for 17 years. It is the most disgusting, disgusting process that I have ever witnessed in my life where you tell a fan base in one of the top five markets in America, yep. go ahead and lose on purpose for years. It's ridiculous. And now, it's amazing, though, if they start winning, though, how quickly people will forget yes. about it and, and they'll move on. I and wanna... I was literally in Philadelphia. I asked them, I said, what happened to y'all? What happened to this city? This city that I loved and worked in for 17 years. Y'all just walking around. Y'all numb to all of this? They losing on purpose? They still taking your money? Are you Are you crazy? That's how bad it got. That's why they're fanatics. When yes. a, a fan that? is short for fanatic. I want to get the one football in yeah. in the in the form of this. Mm-hmm. Nick Saban, Bill Belichick. Either, either, neither, or both with a different team next year. Neither. Um, I think Bill Belichick stays in New England. Um, I think Nick Saban stays in Alabama. Um, I think they should. Uh, you know, when you look at Nick Saban, Temper, you know, from a temperamental perspective, you know, stay where you are because dealing with grown men, uh, that got to pay mortgages, receiving their paychecks and what have you, uh, you, you're going to have a difficult time because you're not going to have the level of control over grown men on a professional level that you can exercise over athletes. Not to mention the fact you got to remember you got a hard salary cap in the NFL essentially and you can go out and you could recruit 30, 35, five star players that have to come to Alabama. It don't work that way in the pros. And so when you look at it from that perspective, I think that the right thing for him to do would be to stay at Alabama. In the case of Bill Belichick, Robert Kraft's not letting him go. Well, that's Just the thing. Pay, it's pay it's pay up money. to Robert Kraft. It's, it's not up to not, Bill Belichick. Not, listen, I know Robert Kraft very well. I've mm-hmm. spoken to him on many occasions. He ain't letting Bill Belichick right. go. He's not letting Why him go. Why would he? And not, and not only that, here's the deal. You're only talking about if you really look at John Gruden's contract, ten years, a hundred million dollars guaranteed. Well, that's ten million. All right. I mean, incentives can throw it up to one twenty from mm-hmm. what I hear, but it's really ten million dollars. Right. Well, Bill Belichick's at seven, seven and a half. 
You can't throw an extra $3 million his way? I think you can. I think Pretty you can easily. if you're the Patriots. And if that's all it takes to keep Bill Belichick, you give him the money he so richly deserves. Well, you just start to wonder if right. egos get involved because I, you never would you think mentioned Kobe and Shaq. Because I mean, Kobe and Shaq, how many could they have won yep. if egos don't get involved? Well, yes. But do egos get involved enough egos to get break in, it Egos out? get involved and on any level, but to a lesser degree in the NFL because it's so dicey and dangerous. See, with basketball, you look like you're Kobe. You literally believed, I'm going to win a championship without Shaquille O'Neal. This is basketball. Give me a couple of players and I'm good. Mm -hmm. Football, there are so many other components that contribute to success. You can't take the risk of really disrupting what you've built. In order because it just because to feed your ego. That's that's not wise and I don't think we would ever call Bill Belichick unwise. But one one last thing before we we'll let you go on football here. You said the Raiders, the Raiders should expect a Super Bowl win within in the four next, years. Within four, within four years. years. You, you know, hundred million dollars? I'm sorry. Listen. Oh, okay. I, I want to make sure you're saying that should be the expectation that's because right. of what they're. Okay, I want to make right. you're not predicting. No, 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 okay, no, no. I want to make sure. We're I said it is. Okay. I, I said it is. Uh, listen, you sign for a hundred million dollars guaranteed, more than the highest guaranteed play a uh, football player, more than any coach in the NFL. Listen, I love John Gruden. He did a great job for us. He's always been kind mm-hmm. to me. I, I love the guy personally, and I know that he is a brilliant football mind and Raider Nation. He's made for Raider Nation. He deserved a job. I wish him nothing but the best. But the man hasn't coached since 2008. The six years the prior to that, where he coached the last six years in the NFL, his record was 45 and 51, 0 and 2 in the playoffs. And somehow, some way, it ain't about getting the job. You got a hundred million dollars. Oh. I'm sorry. You got Derek Carr as your quarterback, who's no scrub, who's in the midst of a 125 million dollar contract. I'm sorry. I need. I want to see a Super Bowl championship within the next four years. And I'm barring injuries, barring injuries. Of no, course. but you're, you're right. I, I just wasn't sure how that how that point was phrased. But, you're right. That should be the expectation. Well, and the stats don't much. bear that out. With That's a right. with a, he's a 12 coach going back to the same team a second time. That's right. And that second time around, the average is three years. The mm-hmm. winning percentage is in the 30 or 40 percent. Right. I mean, it just it doesn't bode well. But when you well, get that kind of money, listen, a deal we're all still we, looking and for. And let's be fair. <laughs> if it were a player. We have expectations yeah. with the money. Yep. If it was, you know, so if, if it were an executive, Phil Jackson comes into New York, you know, he's getting 12 million a year, six times more than most executives that is, you know, that, that's president of basketball mm-hmm. operations in the NBA. And look how he went to bed. You're damn right. There were expectations and it, and it should be. And for John Gruden, it should be no different. Four years, Derek Carr, Amari Cooper, you know, you've got complete control of the franchise because when you get a base of $100 million, ain't nobody working. You nope. ain't working for anybody. They're working no, for you. That's exactly. Okay. Absolutely. Get it done. Stephen A., we appreciate it. We'll Thanks, look forward Steve. to you on First Take and also the Stephen A. Smith Radio Show, 1 to 3 here on ESPN Radio. And by the way, you, you mentioned winning. Mm-hmm. No matter what, John's won. Yeah, John, John has won. The question to me, will the, will you know the Raiders win? I won't say that because he's highly competitive. Yes, but. And he cares that much. No into question. Him. Once a month, you know, it's like, it's like the rest of us. Yeah. Once you get the money and it's directly deposited, you ain't thinking about it because you know it's there. Well, that, that's mm-hmm. maybe for you. Uh, I'm thinking about it all the time. <laughs> Stephen A., thanks very much. A little Def Leppard to keep you going on mm-hmm. a Thursday morning. Golik and Wingo on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. That is definitely our wheelhouse, brother. There. Yeah, it early, is. Early 80s uh, hair band love, heavy metal rock. Uh, it's, we are, it's no hit the Sean Payton, though. No, well, well the hit yeah. the Sean Payton is a whole new yes, thing that's taken is. off. And uh, we will get to that because <laughs> we are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us via the Shell, performance, uh, Shell Penzoil performance line. And uh, because of that little segue yeah. by you, it makes perfect sense. We are delighted to bring in the head coach of the New Orleans Saints, who has a beer and a dance move wow. named after him, which we'll get into. <laughs> Sean Payton with us now uh, this morning on Golden and Wingo. Sean, first of all, congratulations on everything being named after you. <laughs> and also, congratulations on the team's success. You go to Minnesota this weekend. You guys played week one. How different, though, are both of these teams than the, the teams that met on that first Monday night game of the regular season? Good morning, guys. Look, uh, before we talk about how different they are, count me in on that early 80s Def Leppard too. There you go. Yeah. 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 See? (laughs) We love it. That's our wheelhouse. uh, I think uh, there's a lot that's changed. I think from a schematic standpoint, um, you know, they're they're a team and we're a team that have certain uh, schemes that are, I think you see on the rosters are a lot different. I would say more on their offense and, and a little bit more on our defense with injuries that have taken place and through the attrition of you know a 16 week season and the postseason. We were talking about this the other day. If you looked at one team's 53, and then you looked at the 10 practice squad, it's a, it's amazing when you go through that timeline 
you know, guys that come off the roster that get added to the roster, practice squad. And, and so it seems like it's been a long time ago. You know, it seems like almost a season ago. And yet uh, they're playing outstanding football. Uh, they, they've really done a good job of find, finding their formula. It starts with their defense. They've been, they've been unbelievable in every statistic. Um, they're first and third down. They're, first and second run and pass overall scoring defense total defense you name it and and that's you know mike is uh is an expert in that area and he's done a great job but overall as a team i think they've they found <clears throat> that complement offensively as well and you know so you see a personality of a team even though the schemes may be similar you see the confidence grow and i think in both cases <clears throat> both teams are playing with a lot of confidence so along those lines, how do from week one the t- the the video of that game? How is it used this week in preparation, if at all? Well, it's used as part of the cutups, and so when when I ask uh, in a cutup, maybe in a meeting, hey, let's look at all the third down and two to threes. You know, we can we can get recent if we choose the last six, uh, or we can get seasonal. And when you get to the, the stage we're at now in the playoffs. You know, these meetings are late, and we'll look at every third and two to three in the season. So it, it would be part of the cut-up. Now, the same would exist when you're looking at any any field. You know, if you're doing a search uh, and you just want maybe like offenses, well, then your offense would show up. If, if you're doing a search and you want to look at, you know, just your game, Atlanta, maybe – so it's however you search for it, but clearly it's a game we've looked at separately into itself, and then it's also part of what we're studying in these categories cut-up-wise. Sean Payton with us, the Saints head coach, as they are in the playoffs, have won a playoff game already, and heading up to Minnesota this week to take on a very tough Vikings team. You know, Sean, you guys have missed the postseason the last three years, and then I think one of the things that really turned this season around for you was how well you guys did at the draft. And I'm just, I'm just going to list the first four draft picks that the Saints had in 2017. Cornerback Marshawn Lattimore, pro bowler. Uh, then they sneak it into the first round to get Ryan Ramchek, the tackle, who has played every single offensive snap this year. Safety Marcus Williams starts 15 games. And then you get the home run waiting to happen on almost any play. The running back Alvin Kamara, pro bowler, 14 touchdowns. I call him Sean a cephalopod. I don't think he has a bone in his body. He's just so slippery. He seems to get across and get away from any clean hit that anybody ever gets on him. How important has that draft been to what you've been able to do this season? Well, I, I think it was essential uh, this off season when we went through and identified, hey, here are the areas we need to improve, and we kind of targeted in free agency a few positions uh, and then targeted the priorities in the draft. And anytime we've had a decent draft here, generally they've been the right kind of makeup, toughness. They've been talented, but they've also had great football makeup and uh, and that's really been, you know, one of the things that that I've, I've felt is has to has to take place uh, when we evaluate these players. You know, we can't say they learn a little bit, or we think they can learn, or you know, the, the learning's okay. But we have to know uh, what's their football IQ like, what's their toughness like, and a lot of more. You know, came to us a little bit in, in that draft. We weren't certain that that he would be there at eleven. Um, ramp check we were real strong on uh, we felt Marcus Williams you know was in our top 28 we ended up taking him in the beginning of the second round we really took him where we thought we were going to take Kamara wow and we were we were planning on taking Kamara at 210 uh, but Marcus Williams fell a little bit closer to us than we had anticipated so we made that selection and then we chose to trade back into the early third round to take Kamara. And then Alex Anzalone was a player that played for us before injury. Um, and then Al Muhammad was another player that we drafted who's, who's gotten to play. So that class, along with the free agents, look, you know, the Okafor's injured right now, but Manti Teo, A.J. Klein, these guys oh, yeah. were, were, were all key people parts to what we're doing and unfortunately a number of these guys are injured right now but uh the the next guy up has done a good job you know the expat we're talking to sean payton head coach of the saints they play minnesota this weekend in the divisional round 
you know, the expectations of draft picks, we know how that works. You get a guy in last year, Michael Thomas, in the second round, and wow, the kid has been unreal for two years. And then Kamara, one of the, the many draft picks that have worked out in the third round. But the, as we said, the expectation to realization. So you look at a guy like Kareem Hunt, a third round pick for the Chiefs, all of a sudden, right out of the gate, this guy's hitting it. And with Kamara, now early on, you, when you still had AP on the team, he was taking some carries. So what, when did the expectation of what we think this guy could do to the realization of, wow, he can really do it? When did that hit for you with Kamara? Well, look, there's two parts to that. I think. <clears throat> When we went to work them out on a, on not their pro day, but you know it's pretty common to fly around and have private workouts. And I was there that day, and we had the meetings with the players, and they had seven or eight draft players, and uh, Camaro was one of them. And he was in watching film with the quarterback Dobbs, and you could tell right away in the in the just in the meeting that he was awfully awfully football smart, and. That, that was apparent. That's the one thing I remember leaving that day was his football intelligence. And, again, I mentioned this on the onset, but we, we've made too many mistakes in the prior three years where when you look at why didn't it work out, generally it was either football IQ or health. And uh, so that was, that was interesting. Uh, he was fun to be around. And then when we worked him out, I, I kind of put him through a series of different drills that I want. I knew he had good hands, but I wanted to see how strong his hands were. And so, you know, we put him out at receiver. We brought him into the backfield, ran him on a few rail routes, ran him on a few escapes. And all the while, you know, we're kind of talking about football. And uh, if it's hot, I want you to do this. And then he'd do it. And, boy, everything came very smooth in that workout and easily understood. And there, And there's – it, listen, he had a bright smile. I mean, this 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 is a you know not only a talented kid, but a guy you like being around. And I and I uh, I think someone who uh, uh, his teammates enjoy being around. And I remember just getting on the plane. We were heading to Michigan next, and I remember thinking, man, we we have to draft that player. And then it was just a matter of all right, how are we going to get him? And the other back we kind of targeted later was Tariq Cohen. Uh, who's up in Chicago, He, you know, so the vision early on was more of, you know, that Joker type player. And then to his credit, uh, he's handled the carries more than you even got to see in college tape. Well, look, let me just say kudos to your coaching staff You're and, not your, and your scouting staff because those were two home runs yeah. uh, either way you went there. And, and that's all secondary as far as I'm concerned, Coach, because i got to ask you, which do you enjoy better, the fact that you have a song named after you hit the Sean Payton by a local musician there or a beer, the Sean Payton Blonde Ale, released by the local uh, Port <laughs> Orleans Brewing Company? I mean, those are two awesome things. Is there one you prefer over the other? Well, one, I, <laughs> one I've supported because Zach Streif, uh, our right tackle, uh, and his family and his in-laws are in a, <clears throat> just started uh, really a, a nice restaurant, microbrewery, down uh, uptown in the Garden District. And so I was I was uh, on top of the Blondale. Now this uh, this other thing here, you know, <laughs> the the dance thing that I, I that all came without any uh, not not that it needed permission. It just came kind of as a surprise. Well, sometimes those are the best things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and look, just so you know, you're winning. You got yep. the dance, the song, and the beer. That's that's the holy triumvirate for a lot yeah, of us is. here. Sean, uh, congratulations. Uh, we wish you all the best of luck. It's going to be a very tough game in Minnesota. And just because you said what you liked about uh, Def Leppard on the way in, we got a little more music for you on the way out. Right, Cliff, little, hit it. Little, little, ju- little Judas Priest, you got yep. another thing coming from that's the you, same, Sean. From like the it, same right, genre. All right, John, John, thanks so much. We appreciate it. <laughs> We'll see you. We continue on Golik and Wingo on ESPN Radio and ESPN2, and I find working with you fascinating. Why is that? On a lot of levels. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you, you once proclaimed that you never played against Brett Favre, right? And then someone found a picture of I did remember, of yeah. Sacking yeah. him. But it was Brett Favre when he was Brett Favre. When he was not. Bro. Yeah, exactly. He, wasn't, he wasn't the legend. He was just a guy. He was. Exactly he was a right. jag. Just a guy. There you go. Okay. So now you're on this campaign that you want a beer named after you. Yeah. You already have a beer named after you. I knew I had a sandwich named after me. No. Who would have a beer named 2015 after 2015 in Cincinnati, the Moorline oh, yeah. Lager House Brewers created Greeny Short Hop Pale Ale 
and Golick's RBI Rye Ale, named for host Mike Golick. That's true. I do remember. So that. you've already had this. I mean, I want to. I'm be- beginning to worry about you. No, no, no. Here, I, I should have qualified that yeah. because in the, that beer's no longer there. I don't believe. I think it was just for I a short know. time. I, I think it was just for a short time. I think if we call that place, I want a beer named after me that's like made in mass and sold around the country, put in stores. That I want. That is just it was named after me for a short time. Uh, I want something that's named after me for good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nationally sold. I, I like the, the 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 thought of the butt picture. The I butt don't photo on it without the bow. Maybe I'll get my friends at Bud Light to give you your own special line. You okay, like that? I, I like would, that. But I want. But see, to, I don't think you can be in a word with somebody that says light. As much as I love Bud I, Light, I have lost some weight. Well, you know what? Then then it works. We'll make it work. Other names people are naming for my beer: Liquid Golic. Okay. Froth and frosting. That's okay. I do like that. How about the Golic Hammer? Golic's, oh, I do. I love that a lot. <laughs> this one, I don't even know if I can read it, but probably I Probably not. To. I, you probably shouldn't then. <laughs> I, I, I want to, but I won't. A light beer called the Senior Discount? Come on now. There you go. Uh, what is that? Big Daddy Smooth also came Ooh, in. Ooh, I like, like that, that one? I do like that. By the way, there, we have a, a little more news here mm-hmm. for you. Uh, the, the Bears coaching staff it <clears throat> continues to be very interesting. Uh-huh. Matt Nagy, of course, we... Both covered when he played right. quarterback in the, the arena, arena league. league yeah. He gets her. He stand uh, the great offensive line coach from Notre Dame. <laughs> yes, he's now Mark Helfrich, the former Oregon head coach, is going to be the offensive coordinator. Okay, now that I find that interesting. That to me, again, the head coaches are interesting, no doubt where they go. But then the staff they bring in, because a lot of times a head coach is more leaning to one side of the ball. Nagy would be toward the offensive side of the ball. Right. So then it gets interesting, who do you bring in on the defensive side to kind of run the show? That's the same for you know any coach out there, what side of the ball they're on and who they bring in uh, to run it. So th- I, I'm, And they all have their list. Every coach that wants to be a head coach has that list of, of, of coaches they're going to call. They're going to find out, hey, can you be on my staff? I think one of the more amazing stories is, how about Rich Gannon? Yeah. On the plane to Oakland. Decides when he's on the plane, he said, came to my senses and realized I don't want to be a coach. And talking about possibly being on the staff with John Gruden in with the Oakland Raiders. And yeah. in the plane, he said, you know what? It came to my senses and say, I don't want to do this. I, I can't match Gruden's passion and yeah. I don't want to jump with both feet into this coaching world. Better at 30,000 feet than after landing and signing. That's the contract. exactly I, right. I yes. If you're, if you're going to have that revelation, do it then while you're, uh, while you're looking through the, yep. uh, American, uh, American Airlines magazine or the Delta <laughs> Sky Mag instead of after you've signed the paper. Then it hits you. I don't want to yeah. do this. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, quite the show today. Coming up on Friday, we got Malik Jackson of the Jaguars, nice. Adam Thielen of the Vikings will join us as we'll break down Conference semifinal weekend. See you on Friday. Go and wake up. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico. I feel like I'm on top of the world. Disclaimer, you will not be transported to the top of the world. In the unlikely event you find yourself at the Arctic Circle, seek shelter from the elements immediately to avoid frostbite and or hypothermia. Geico will not be responsible if you find yourself in a cave or crevasse with a lonely abominable snowman, who in all likelihood will force you to play games including, but not limited to, Go Fish, Charades, Chinese Checkers, or his personal favorite, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Yeti on over. Geico is not liable for any damages, either physical or emotional. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.